Greetings, Chicago. Um, it is a tremendous pleasure to uh, be talking with you, to be invited to speak at IBAM um, once again. My name is Turtle Bunbury. I came over to Chicago uh, in 2016 and spoke at IBAM, uh, thanks to Cliff and all those involved in that. It was a, an absolutely fabulous uh, time for me. Uh, I can't believe it is uh, pushing four years already since that time. Um, when I was over uh, for IBAM, I was talking about a series of books I was, um, have written called Vanishing Ireland. Um, today, I'm here to talk about uh, another book, and you won't be looking at me, I'll be putting up a slideshow in a little while. It's this book called Ireland's Forgotten Past, which um, came out in uh, March this year, March 2020. Uh, we had planned a lovely, lively launch in Ireland, but obviously uh, coronavirus put paid to that. Um, I'd also hope to come to talk uh, about it in Chicago in person, uh, and but maybe I'll, I'll, I will be able to do so in 2021. Um, so it is uh, terrific to be able to connect through the power of 2020 technology. Um, as the crow flies, I'm presently 5,867 kilometers away from Chicago, but hopefully you can hear me in real time. Um, just to give you uh, a little perspective, uh, that is the view from uh, where I live in the countryside in County Carlo. Green, grand, soft, autumnal day we have uh, going on here. All right, I'm now going to transfer over, hoping that this uh, works well, to my um, slideshow. Um, and this will uh, be where we go from here. It is, uh, Ireland's Forgotten Past, is a little history of Ireland, uh, or sort of. It's about... Um, lesser known stories about Ireland's past, stories about some of the more unusual people who've emerged in Ireland over the centuries. Um, you know, I, I go right back to the Stone Age or before that even, right through the, the Celts, the Romans, the Vikings, the Normans, the Tudors, the Georgians, so many different people, right up to the present time. I kick off with um, this fella, I hope. The very first Irishman, I wonder. Um, this is where the story begins. The first chapter uh, is with uh, this little fellow who is called a Devonian tetrapod. Uh, and he pitter pattered upon uh, this beautiful island uh, a mere 385 million years ago. You can see his footprints there. Um, and it's a, I think that they must be made in the same way that when you lay down fresh tar on the road, and somebody walks on it. It's the same concept there. Uh, and apparently those uh, paw prints of his are, as I say, 385 million years ago. Don't ask me how anybody's able to uh, say that, but anyway, that's what they say. Uh, and I put them down because it, those are, those footprints are, um, you know, one of the very earliest indications of any form of life in Ireland. Um, in terms of humanity, we've been uh, rocking around Ireland for about 11,000 years. Um, the first real settlements came in the Mesolithic Age, which is um, the sort of 8,000 years ago. And you can see on the map here, the settlements that start turning up in that period, the little green and, and uh, bronzy brown dots uh, are where the first human settlements kicked off in Ireland. Okay, uh, if you've been to Ireland, you probably have um, been heard of, of Newgrange. Um, which is kind of the piece de resistance of um, the Stone Age Ireland. It is truly magnificent. It's a man-made grave for the ancient kings of Ireland. Um, it dates to about 3200 BC, they reckon, uh, which makes it a little older than the pyramids. And what you have is this mound of uh, rock and earth, 200,000 uh, 200, tons of it, put there by human hand uh, and whatever shovels they were using in 3200 BC uh, to create this um, passage grave. And on the winter solstice, that's the 21st of December, every year the sun rolls down the corridor that you're looking at there. That's a 19 meter corridor, it's a damp proof passage. And it goes down there, the sun as it rises and it widens and it ends up striking this uh, illuminating this chamber at the other end of it and inside that chamber is a Celtic triple motif, one of those spirals you may be familiar with, 
and it lights it all up for about 14 minutes on the 21st of December, a little bit less on the days either side of that. And it's been pulling that trick off for 5,200 years, which is pretty amazing. And it is the legacy of the Neolithic people who I think are the most fascinating of the ancient peoples to have come to Ireland. They built at least uh, what we know of about 1500 of these man-made monuments, we call them megaliths. They're scattered all around Ireland. They built them over the course of about 1500 years that they were uh, dominant in Ireland. Um, quite a lot of them are aligned to the solstice uh, and the equinox like this one, the Ectocura stones down in Kerry. Uh, aligned with the September equinox and others have fizzle with static electricity. They are considered to be the world's oldest clocks um, and they would tell you the time of uh, year if not the time of day which is a very handy thing if you are a farming people which is what the Neolithic settlers were. Close to where I am the, my book is full of illustrations uh, by a fellow called Joe McLaren, lovely uh, line drawings and that's a depiction of the Browns Hill Dolmen which is beside where I live in uh, County Carlow it's again, it's a burial chamber, presumably for somebody of power and influence uh, from, uh, again, roughly about 5,000 years ago. Uh, and that capstone, the top stone on that uh, burial tomb is 103 tons. It's the same weight as a Boeing 757 airplane. Um, and uh, I think if you lined up 200 Super Bowl players and asked them to push it, I don't think they would. I don't think they could. It's amazing. But, uh, there's another one here. This is right beside where I live. Uh, you could probably pick that up if you're a, a handful of Super Bowl players, but still, uh, you know, beautiful, gorgeous, very impressive burial chambers, all quite often, a, you know, on a height or by a river. Uh, as I say, they were very tough people, the Neolithics, and you would not want to pick a fight with someone from the Neolithic age. They did a scientific analysis of uh, arm bones belonging to Neolithic women. Uh, from Central Europe uh, around about the time that these dolmens were, were built uh, and that analysis showed that they were about 16% more muscular than Cambridge University's female rowing crew. So you know very very tough strong people. Uh, we're finding out stuff all the time just behind that dolmen I just showed you there uh, a couple of years ago we had a really hot summer and somebody sent a drought over and hopefully you can see all those circles in the field uh, those circles indicate uh, a lot of stuff that we have yet to uncover. They are, again, ancient graves and, and uh, barrow ditches and things like that from that period. Amazing. We have it all around us in Ireland. Okay, uh, into the, the Bronze Age, which is, comes kind of after the Neolithic Age. And this is when Ireland starts to gain uh, international attention in Europe because... Uh, the people are becoming more and more skilled at working with copper uh, and bronze and gold. And we have, uh, as well as good beer, apparently the beer was getting quite good, even at that time. Um, the, what you're looking at there is a lunulai, which is a gold neck bracelet that uh, ladies and gentlemen wore literally around their head collars. It was the must have trinket of the late third millennium BC. Um, and we find these in Ireland more gold hoards have been found from, from the Bronze Age. More gold hoards have been found in Ireland than anywhere else on earth. And if you should come to Ireland and you go to the National Museum, for instance, you will see examples of this uh, amazing craft work from all those uh, centuries ago. I spin forward through the Celtic Age into the Roman Age. Now the Romans, they never conquered Ireland as such. They didn't even try. The closest they came was when uh, there was a governor of Roman Britain. His name was Agricola, uh, and he apparently stood on the north coast of Ulster, a bit like uh, the depiction here by Joe McLaren, um, and he looked out uh, from Scotland. Sorry, he stood on the coast of Scotland looking at Ulster up in Northern Ireland, and apparently declared he could have taken out the entire country with a single legion. Yeah, right. Not a chance, but in any case, um, the Romans' influence, they were uh, basically the, the, the number one power in Europe for nearly four centuries, um, um, and their influence was, was massive. We have found a lot of coins and metalwork and uh, tableware and all the sort of trade goods around Ireland. Their uh, biggest 
legacy, the legacy of the Romans, is still actually very much with us in Ireland to this day. Uh, Christianity uh, and the Roman Catholic Church that it gave rise to. When you, and uh, look at that uh, St. Patrick's Day parade, do you remember those days when we could all hang out like that without masks? The only uh, crazy masks on your face maybe, but uh, other than that, it was all fun and games of St. Patrick's Day. And St. Patrick was a Roman. Um, his father was a Roman tax collector. Um, so, you know, that's quite a, an enduring legacy of the uh, Roman age that our patron saint uh, and the man credited with bringing Christianity to Ireland um, is, as I say, uh, a son of Rome. Um, but, you know, it goes deeper than that because Rome, as Rome was actually starting to fall apart when St. Patrick uh, was a boy, he was uh, captured by pirates just after the Roman legions had left Britain. Um, but, uh, the, you know, we call it the dark ages that followed. They weren't as dark as all that, but in Ireland particularly, because that's where much of the knowledge and learning that was gathered during the Roman age uh, was actually preserved in Irish monasteries um, all the way over to the west coast of Ireland. It was preserved in those monasteries during the, the 6th, 7th uh, centuries AD. And actually, if you come uh, to Ireland, you, you can go to these ruined monasteries, these places where maybe a thousand students were once uh, studying at a time 10, 1200 years ago. And you'll find these beautiful things like these high crosses. This is down in County Tipperary, the Henny High Cross. Um, and I have a chapter about the high crosses in the book as well, because they're works of incredible uh, art, I must say. There's a, another one. They, the early one I just showed you there is this sort of Celtic interlace patterns. Um, but as time goes on, it moves into more biblical depictions showing key scenes from the from the Bible, which were they were kind of the school books of the 8th, 9th, 10th century. So amazing things. Then came the Vikings. Now, the Vikings, uh, like the Romans, actually, the Vikings were a dominant force uh, in Ireland for, for, um, for, again, about 400 years. Uh, so not surprisingly, they have an enormous legacy. Um, our, our, our cities, Dublin, Limerick, Waterford, Wexford, Carlingford, anything with fjord in the title, um, they all start off uh, as Viking towns. Um, and we are finding out more and more about them all the time. Earlier this year, just before uh, lockdown began, for instance, they were uh, doing some excavations up in Dublin City at a place called Ship Street, uh, very near Dublin Castle, uh, which revealed that Dublin, from which Dublin gets its name, the original pool on the river Poddle where the Vikings first settled, it revealed that that was actually much bigger than we have previously thought. And in fact, the size starts to tally uh, with the size of um, the harbour that uh, the Vikings wrote about uh, in, in their um, chronicles of the time, a, a harbour that was capable of keeping up to 200 longships at once. So suddenly that, uh, having thought that that was just an exaggeration, that's starting to become more and more within the realms of possibility. Um, Dublin was established as a city by Norse Vikings, um, who were Ostmen, we call them, or men of the East. Uh, that was in about 841 AD. And it was part of a, a regional power block that extended, it extended right all the way up the west coast of Scotland and Northern England, uh, it took in places like the Isle of Man, the Hebrides, the Orkneys, all the way up to Norway, uh, where uh, they have found plenty of Irish metalwork in um, Viking graves, probably plunder, but possibly merchandise. Um, so I've, I've looked at the Vikings. Actually, I've told their story through a man called um, Citric Silkbeard, um, who was a remarkable man. He was the king of Dublin for 46 years, a Viking. Um, and uh, he, his time coincided with that of Brian Boru, who you may have heard of, the uh, very uh, famous High King of Ireland, um, who was, uh, it's very confusing, he was Citric Silkbeard's father-in-law, and he was Citric Silkbeard's son-in-law. You'll have to uh, go to the book to try and make sense of that one. But Citric was an extraordinary man. He uh, shaped the city of Dublin like few kings in history. And I think What's important about the Vikings, um, and indeed the people I'm about to turn to next, the Normans, is um, that scientists at Trinity College Dublin, where I was uh, a student, 
um, uh, a couple of years ago, 2018, that they conducted a study into uh, the genetic traits of people in Ireland and Britain. And they discovered that actually it turns out people in Ireland have a lot more Nordic blood uh, than previously thought. You know, intermarriage with uh, Vikings and indeed with the Normans uh, and Irish families was, was commonplace during the uh, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th century. That's 500 years there off the bat. Uh, so needless to say, there are a lot more nuances to uh, the identity of who's who in Irish history, um, even back in those days. I, for instance, am uh, a Norman. Uh, through and through, really. I mean, uh, Bunbury, my surname, that is uh, a Norman family um, who settled in a place called Bunbury, it became called Bunbury in Cheshire in England, uh, and then came over to Ireland in the 17th century. Uh, and my mother's family were the Butlers, uh, who arrived in uh, the 12th century, just uh, about 850 years ago, um, as part of the Cambro Norman invasion. It still makes me <laughs> an enemy of a sort uh, in Ireland, 850 years on. What did the Normans ever do for us? Well, they did bring in feudalism uh, and the tax system and the parish system. And an early form of the English language, although, of course, the, uh, the first uh, generations, plural, of uh, Normans who came to Ireland all would have spoken French. That would have been their main language. They gave us chivalry, knights on horseback, um, and uh, castles. Those uh, castles, many of which are, are now glorious ruins on our landscape. They gave us pheasants and frogs and fallow deer and new types of apple uh, trees and pear trees. And they, they affected our landscape everywhere. I think of them when I go out to my garden and I see what the rabbits have done to my garden because it was the Normans who brought the rabbits and I think, burn you Normans, bringing your rabbits here. Anyway, as I say, I'm a, I'm a Norman, so I can't really uh, get too excited about that one. I have told the Norman story uh, through um, the Knights Templar. Uh, here we go, that is Russell Crowe as a Knights Templar. Uh, for those who don't know, the Knights Templar were an uber wealthy military order. They were uh, founded in uh, Jerusalem in 1119 uh, and their job was to protect pilgrims um, from being mugged and murdered uh, by thugs uh, on the roads leading into Jeros Jerusalem, the holy city of Jerusalem, which was at that time under Norman control. The same Normans who were in Ireland uh, would also run the kingdom of Jerusalem. Amazing. Uh, by the time the first wave of those French-speaking uh, warriors invaded Ireland uh, in 1169, so that's uh, 50 years on from the foundation of the Knights Templar, uh, the Templars were by then the, the, the sort of um, elite of the crusading army. So I look at them and their role in Ireland and how that played out. I look at their eventual bloody downfall. They had a pretty grim ending. And I looked at uh, the story of William Marshall, who is, um, he's buried as a Knight Templar. He was uh, one of the greatest knights of his, of his time. And he married Isabel de Clare, who's the Irish heiress. Uh, she was the granddaughter of Dermot McMurrah, the King of Leinster. And Isabel and William, it's, a, it's an extraordinary story. And they um, built a huge number of castles around uh, where I live in the Kilkenny, Carlow, Wexford area. Uh, and they built lighthouses and, and ports and all sorts of things. So it's, it's a fascinating, fabulous story. Um, because the book is kind of uh, an attempt to tell the history of Ireland, I have to speed along because it's a small book, a slim book, a very postable book. Um, and uh, so I run through colourful events like the Wars of the Roses, which um, for those who've enjoyed uh, Game of Thrones, the Wars of the Roses is a kind of blueprint uh, for where uh, Mr. Martin got his, got his plot lines. Extraordinary, extraordinary era. Um, and I talk about uh, connections to people like Perkin Warbeck and Anne Boleyn, all of who have, whom have Irish connections. Anne Boleyn, of course, was the mother of this lady you're looking at. Um, that is Queen Elizabeth, the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, uh, who reigned uh, as queen for the bones of 40 years. Um, and so I talk about that, the whole Tudor age, um, and just behind Queen Elizabeth, you can see the Spanish Armada, the big uh, event for which she would become 
uh, so famous because it was destroyed on her watch. She managed to destroy the mighty armada in 1588. And I talk about how that um, impacted Ireland uh, through the eyes of uh, a man called Sir William Stanley, um, who was uh, a fellow who changed sides uh, and thought the Spanish were going to win. So he, having been in, held in high regard by Queen Elizabeth, he backed the wrong horse and uh, went over to the Spanish. Uh, I also tell the story of Hugh Maguire, who was the last uh, king of Fermanagh, who was killed in a very ill-advised ambush uh, down in Cork uh, at the tail end of Queen Elizabeth's reign. Um, okay, we are, oh sorry, there is the Spanish Armada, another image of that. Uh, we are uh, coming towards the tail end of my talk already, it would seem. Um, you're looking there at uh, a picture of uh, Oliver Cromwell, uh, is, is depicted there. Oliver Cromwell is uh, probably the most despised man in Irish history. Um, I tell his story through uh, a Dublin tailor called Daniel Byrne, who uh, was an opportunist, if ever there was one. When uh, Cromwell arrived, he brought 43,000 soldiers with him, the new model army, and they didn't have a uniform, or they didn't have a very satisfactory uniform, I guess. Uh, and Daniel Byrne bought himself a massive amount of white cloth. Um, he dyed it all red, and then he hired 40 apprentice tailors and set them up um, in a sort of tailor's shop yard by Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin. And they made the uniforms for Cromwell's army. That was the original redcoats uh, made in Dublin. Uh, and Taylor did, uh, sorry, Taylor, um, uh, Daniel Byrne, the, the tailor, did so well out of it that he was able to buy uh, a huge chunk of the former kingdom of Leinster uh, down in County Leash, uh, and also managed to get his son made a baron uh, at the same time. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> after Cromwell, that was the 1640s, uh, 1650s, uh, the next real um, era of warfare culminated famously in the Battle of the Boyne, um, which uh, was fought in 1690. And I tell that story through a horse, actually, a war horse who was there called the Byerly Turk, um, because it was a very famous horse that uh, competed in races, some of the very first uh, horse races. And he also uh, managed to uh, go through the Battle of the Boyne and, and come out on top. Uh, I'm always fascinated by uh, the story, um, by the, sorry, the diary of a, a Jacobite officer who fought at the Battle of the Boyne. The Battle of the Boyne was the Jacobite army of James II, the last of the Stuarts, the last Catholic monarch in Britain or Ireland, um, on the one side, and his uncle stroke father-in-law, these things are so complicated sometimes, on the other side, in the other ring, William of Orange, um, later to become William III of England, uh, who was married to James's daughter. So you have the Jacobites against the Williamites, and the Williamites won. And one reason why they uh, won is, <clears throat> well, on the morning of the battle, this Jacobite officer, John Stevens, he took a walk along the south bank of the Boyne to assess the state of the two armies. He was able to see the Williamites opposite and his own men around him, uh, and to his mounting disgust, he uh, noted that a huge number of his own men were sprawled unconscious upon the river bank, and that the air reeked of brandy. Uh, in his journal, he explained that King James had decided to send a whole load of brandy over to all the regiments, his regiments, in order to cheer his men up, which was not necessarily the wisest move. It might have worked okay if the brandy had got there on time. The problem was the brandy was late. I mean, days, if not weeks late. So when it finally arrived, the soldiers went berserk and they abandoned their lines and they began ripping the lids off the brandy, uh, <clears throat> off the barrels and thrusting their kettles and their hats and their helmets in and pouring it into themselves to such an extent that as John Stevens noted, they drank so extravagantly that I am sure above a thousand men were thereby tendered unfit for service, and most were left dead drunk, scattered about the fields. So, you know, the Battle of the Boyne is a pretty close event. It could have gone either way, but if you've got a thousand men, as Stevens says, lying unconscious, drunk, uh, and disorderly, um, maybe that, that changed it. I don't know. <clears throat> what I can also tell you is that uh, James II 
of Scotland, uh, of, of, of Ireland, sorry, he was the King of Scotland as well, King of England, King of Ireland. And maybe one reason why so many people went up in arms against him is that they weren't ready for his dress sense yet. That is uh, a portrait of uh, James II, who lost at the Battle of the Boyne. Mm. He fled from the battlefield and would become known as uh, Seamus the Shit. Sorry, that's what he became known as by the Jacobites because he had deserted his men in the course of battle. Now, bear in mind that, that uh, all the histories of uh, those war were written by the victors. So who knows uh, what really happened? And James wasn't as bad as all that. When he was a young man, he was the Duke of York. Um, and in fact, New York is named for him. He was quite a successful uh, admiral uh, in the Navy and the Royal Navy owes its early origins to him. So he wasn't uh, quite the Muppet that he is sometimes made out to be. Okay, I spin through um, a lot of the Georgian age through characters like Joshua Dawson, who was a spy master who built the mansion house in Dublin uh, and was an, an extremely sort of manipulative character that uh, would make a, a great villain in a, in a miniseries. Um, I go through the Hellfire Club, this sort of <clears throat> gathering of debauched and decadent uh, Georgian gentlemen um, who were dominant around Ireland in the 18th century. I look at, <coughs> excuse me, I look at a pretty interesting um, era in the, uh, started in the 1890s. It was a, uh, hang on a second. Are we there? Sorry, I've, I've made a boo boo here. <clears throat> oh, there we go. I think we're back on. Um, I talk about the Congested Districts Board, which is an extraordinary thing. It sounds a bit like a, <clears throat> a medical complaint. I might have, have a bit of the Congested Districts Board going on myself at the moment. It was, <coughs> oh God, right, baloney. I talk about the Congested Districts Board, um, which was uh, a pretty amazing, well, oh, bollocks. <clears throat> I talk about the uh, CBD, the Congested Districts Board, uh, which sounds like a medical complaint, but it's actually this very ambitious plan by British Conservatives, the British Tories who were in power in, in government in, in Britain in the, in the 1890s. And what they wanted to do was they were going to kill the Home Rule campaign by being uber kind. They were going to nice everybody into submission and spend an enormous amount of money in Ireland trying to develop the country. So everybody just dropped this whole nationalist agenda and said, no, look, we're totally happy to be part of the British Empire. We'll, you know, we'll leave that whole, uh, as I say, nationalist thing behind. Um, it's not really talked about very much, the congested districts board. It didn't really fit the 20th century narrative, but it's a really fascinating era uh, they focused on the poorer, more forgotten uh, districts of Ireland all along the Atlantic shore from Donegal uh, down through Sligo and Mayo and Clare and Galway and Limerick and Kerry into uh, West Cork. Uh, these days we call it the Wild Atlantic Way. Um, and really there was very little for the population to work with in those parts. If your Irish uh, ancestors came, came from Ireland, there's a strong chance they came from one of those counties because there really wasn't very much to do. You're working with bog and stone and water. Um, and as I, I discovered in my Vanishing Ireland book, you know, that's where uh, the emigration really uh, came from in, in those parts. It's predominantly Irish speaking areas, massive emigration. So the Tories thought, well, the, the British government thought, well, let's try and stop this. Let's try and, you know, create some industry in these places. And they uh, brought in oh, the bridges and new roads and drainage schemes. They, all along the coast, they built fishing piers like the one you're looking at there at Downings in County Donegal. 
curing stations, uh, beacons and lighthouses, and they developed a lot of cottage industries, um, handloom weaving, knitting, uh, tweed, carpet making, if you think of, uh, you might have heard of Killy Beggs carpets or Donegal tweed, that all started in this era. Um, I think the most visible legacy was uh, the railway, uh, the horseless carriage as it was known. Uh, they radically extended that network, uh, putting about 16,000 people were men, uh, mostly, almost, uh, al almost all men, who were put to work laying um, what turned out to be 15 new lines into the west of Ireland. Uh, as I say, Donegal, Mayo, Connemara, West Clare, Kerry. Um, the viaduct, just to give you an insight into what that meant, there's a viaduct, you can see the remains of it, uh, that carried the Connemara Railway across the River Corrib from Galway. And it shortened the journey time from Galway to Clifton in Connemara. Uh, it was eight hours swashed inside a Bianconi coach. Uh, and with the train journey, suddenly that was shortened to two and a half hours. So, you know, pretty massive uh, impact there. So, that's towards the tail end of my book. Then uh, the last, well, there's a chapter about uh, the Irish in the First World War. And then there is a chapter uh, called uh, about Operation Shamrock, which is this extraordinary Red Cross uh, humanitarian initiative at the end of World War II to bring um, German children from their war-torn homeland uh, to enjoy some peace in Ireland. These are children who have been absolutely traumatized by all the bombing that had gone on in Germany. Um, you know, when they were when they were children, babies. And I tell it through the eyes of nine-year-old Herbert Remmel, who I was in touch with yesterday. Uh, he's still very much alive and well. When he was nine, he disembarked from the mail boat at Dunleary in 1946 uh, as one of these children uh, who'd come to Ireland uh, with the Operation Shamrock. Uh, and he was so overwhelmed by the, the group that came out to, uh, to, to hurrah and greet him uh, that he was given an orange and he didn't know what to do, so he sank his teeth into it. Um, and so peeling an orange was one of uh, the many useful things he would learn to do in Ireland. The depiction you see there is of a fountain in St. Stephen's Green, which stands as a mark of German gratitude uh, to this. And it kind of also, I think the event showcased uh, the innate Irish empathy for the downtrodden and this is moving in the 1940s, 1950s, and it's the start of this sort of brave new Ireland, um, a country that consistently punches way above its weight uh, on the international scene. So um, that's really where we've got to with it. Sorry, that's a, a shameless plug for um, some of the books I've um, written over the years. Um, but the book that we are talking about here today is... Um, is this one, is Ireland's Forgotten Past. And so hopefully if you, uh, you know, like your, your tales of, of uh, ancient forts and um, ruined castles and, uh, you know, all these overgrown graveyards where the forgotten stories lie, this book will be for you. Um, thank you very much for listening. I uh, have very much enjoyed uh, giving a little chat to IBAM 2020. Cheerio.